John Clay Burnett is a creative director with RealCast Productions. He's a director, editor, colorist, and was the editor of Washington's Armor, a fantastic TV show pilot that just released this past year. We'll talk with him about how he makes an impact from the editor's chair on this episode of Inroads. Inroads is a production of Appian Media. We want to talk about the release of our Lessons from the Land, the Gospels video series. It's a children's series that consists of 13 video lessons on different topics from the Gospels. We'll have more on that coming up later in the show. Welcome to Inroads, where we talk about the why of Appian Media and how you can use the technology of today to spread the timeless message of the Bible. You can learn more about us and watch our free video series at appianmedia.org. Joining us in the studio, and I use That's air right. quotes, <laughs> is, uh, is John Clay Burnett. Uh, thanks for finally joining us. We've been trying to get this thing together yeah. since pre-COVID, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm glad to, to finally at least connect in this way. Yeah. yeah. Glad, glad to be on. You know, there's a lot of guests that we have, John, that uh, we know them personally or we have had a relationship with them. I don't know anything about you. Like straight up nothing. So this is going to be a really great conversation because I'm going to learn some new things while we chat today. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, maybe let's start with uh, a little bit about you then. Intro, you, uh, we met you earlier this year. Was it this year? Um, Content man. 19, that was last <laughs> was, year. That was wow. last year. It was last in 2019. Fall. It's been yeah. a long few months, yeah. hasn't it? <laughs> it has been. Um, we met you sometime in the past at the Content 19, the, the Christian Film Festival there in Texas. And uh, I just got a sense that you, you know your way around a film set. So uh, <laughs> tell, us, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yes, uh, thanks. I'm John Clay Burnett and uh, specialize in editing and color. Um, my passion and heart behind anything I do is helping communicate truth with excellence. It's a kind of a life mission, which then bleeds over into um, gifting skills, passion in the film arena as well. Mm-hmm. So any, anytime I'm involved with things of truth, I want to be uh, a tool and help uh, do those things with excellence. It's, um, I've been telling stories and talking ever since I was little. So uh, people are like, how long have you been doing this? I'm like, ah, forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was little, I started doing Lego movies. Um, I did skits, plays with socks, puppets, paper cutouts, uh, wrangled my siblings into being, you know, actors in my little dramas. We got home video cameras, started doing stuff in the yard, nothing that's public. I mean, it was just <laughs> stupid, run around the yard kind of stuff, right? Uh, started making things with my friends, kind of run around the backyard and camouflage, but we did, we did the Bible smuggling movie, not lightsabers movies. We didn't, you know, so, uh, but we still did, we still did the run around the backyard with cameras stuff. I knew I wanted to be in film, but didn't know if there was a way to make a career out of it if it was something i could do and raise a family um if if it was something i need to go to college for it just a lot of questions uh, and this is uh well pushing about 20 years ago uh when the christian film industry was was really even more early stages than it, than it might be considered now uh so i actually talked to a friend of mine who worked for a christian ministry that went on to work for billy graham um, ministry and is still a director and producer there for a lot of their content and does a fantastic job. Um, so I reached out to him and just said, what do I need to do? Like, we're really, how do I get into this? Do I need to go to film school? And uh, his advice was, why don't you take that money and start making your own projects, get other people to look at them, get feedback, send them to me. He said, I'll give you some notes. Um, Cause most of the time people coming out of film school are just going to start at the bottom levels and have to work up just as you would even if you didn't go to film school. Not to say there's no benefit to film school, but uh, especially back you know, 15, 20 years ago, there, there were less options. <laughs> there wasn't even like online stuff really at the time mm-hmm. either. So the, you have to remember that was, was pretty limited in the options to get, to get film training uh, that was gonna be even remotely affordable. So I did, I took his advice, started making some of my own projects. I actually interned at a company for three years, part-time, making a five minute video every month for the corporate world. That's really where I learned um, for the nerds. I was on uh, Mac OS 9 on a G4 computer on Final Cut 2. And they actually had printed manuals. And I read the whole manual because oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm that kind of guy. And, and that's where I learned. I started writing, directing, 
uh, voiceover recording, editing, all the stuff every month. And so it was a very repetitious type of thing. Started going to film festivals, met groups of people. Uh, a lot of things that that unknowingly, but as I look back, were very instrumental in building towards a career in film. Since then, I worked for them for three years. Uh, they were, it was time to upgrade equipment and they were ready to move on with the video department in other directions. And um, so I started my own company and uh, took the money I had saved, saved money. There's another key point there. And uh, started my own business called Real Cast Productions in 2005. I was uh, very young. I was, how old was it? 2005 would have been 19. And oh, wow. Um, yeah. I've just grown since then. I've, I've done a lot in promo film space. I've also then been involved with feature films in the camera operating and then also some in editing and color. I've done a lot of work in documentary. A uh, funny story about that is that uh, my first on my backyard movie I told you about, right? It was like a 15 minute movie. And I wanted to make it behind the scenes because that's what cool filmmakers do. And it was 20 minutes. So my, my behind the scenes documentary was longer than my, yeah, of course my it actual was. film. Sounds about right. And uh, a friend of mine watched it and he says, ah, oh, your movie's all right but I really liked your behind the scenes documentary. <laughs> nice. Uh, you might have a future in documentary. And I was like, oh, don't jinx my life, man. No, I want to be a filmmaker. I, who wants to spend their life in documentary? They're boring, they're long, they're crummy quality. Yuck, I don't want to be a documentary filmmaker. Lo and behold, 20 years later, here I am having most of my experience in documentary film. <laughs> and my company does promotional filmmaking, doing interviews and even mini documentary type stuff. And I've learned to have a real passion uh, and, and love for real stories, capturing people's journeys, their life, and creating that content, truth, with excellence in a way that is also visually interesting for people to go on that journey, to, to finish the film, to hear what's being said, and go on that experience. So uh, it's kind of a bit of a, a snippet. I've done a little bit of here, a little bit there, but um, have, have rounded out to specialize right now in editing and color. And also with my production company, we, we also produce content for organizations. That's fantastic. So the, the stories of roping your siblings in to shoot stuff in the backyard, like I'm right there with you, man. Hey, That's, who hasn't made the Lego film before? Yeah, I every mean, like, single one of them. Every right? single person who did documentary filmmaking or just wanted yeah. to be in film, I think started with the Lego film That's movies, right. the stop motion well, this Legos. Was, this was pre-DSLR days. Yeah. Like right? You, you wow. can now take one, literally, legitimately one frame at a time. This was back in high eight home video where you press and record you're hitting one to two seconds at a time it's it's very stop and go motion yeah wow. stop wow. and go I love mm -hmm. that. <laughs> that's so fantastic but there's honestly there's a lot that you can learn the yes. fundamentals of of telling a story and of setting up shots mm -hmm. with just those little plastic people it's true yep so and, and even creating a set and a background and like all yeah. of that so that's part of it yeah love it story is what's most important it's, that's right it's true Story is most important. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, you spend most of your time editing and coloring. Um, I mean, do you enjoy being stuck in a dark room in front of a computer screen? Is that what you, <laughs> is that your passion? Or, I mean, like, is that just kind of where you landed? Or uh, how did you get into that particular element of filmmaking? Sure. I, I'm, a, I'm very, I'm very detail oriented. I'm very logical, strategic thinker. And so editing is, is just like secondhand nature to me. I, it's very easy. It sounds, um, I kind of hate, it's like, it feels weird to say that, but I'm just trying to be uh, self-aware of just of, of my natural tendency to look at very complex information and be able to extrapolate the key pieces that are necessary and then be able to put those together and meet deadlines backwards. Like I just do that very naturally, which I thought was what everybody did until, until I learned that like everybody has different skills yep. and different mm -hmm. giftings. And so I'm like, <laughs> Oh, this, this is, this is kind of unique, not unique to me only, but, th but it's, it's something that uh, I can serve others with and bring that skill to the table. So I love editing. I love crafting the story in that way, finding solutions, finding options, problem solving with directors uh, is just, I do. I, I, I forget to sleep. I forget to eat. It's, I, I do love it. If I sit too long, I get my hand gets a little itchy for the red button and I like to go <laughs> film some more interviews or I like to go out and do, you know, put some stories together and I'll do something with the kids in the backyard or we've got stuff we do for, you know, some of our um, production clients or those kind of things. But I'm, I'm, when you do the personality test, I land on the introverted side of things, oddly enough, interestingly enough, not surprisingly <laughs> enough, probably. And so I'm, I'm really quite happy 
sitting at an editing desk and focusing and spending hours even uh, cranking through and, and helping helping craft stories in this way. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. I, I, think I, I started, like, just to go back, when I started getting into it, I was looking, what, what is the weakest link in Christian film that, that needed help? And, you know, years and years, years ago, I was looking at the visual quality. Um, and I was, so I wanted to get into cinematography and, or camera work. And I said, people, people are telling great stories. They're just not filming them well in a way that people can bear to watch through it mm -hmm. to hear the message and get to the end. So that was where I started, was back in cinematography and camera work. I was able to be on a few projects in that role. Then the DSLR, the digital revolution stuff cropped, came, became more widely available. Cameras got cheaper. More people were able to um, put more time into and focus into that. And it wasn't as needed uh, in helping elevate the Christian film industry. And so I started looking at what are other things that I can do. I also don't, uh, I like editing because I can be home more mm -hmm. and having a family. It's more conducive to that type of lifestyle. So we still travel, um, still go to film sets once in a while. But but I wanted to try to find something that I could do from home, still help serve the Christian film industry, uh, and also use the giftings and uh, just kind of knack that I've got on, on some of these things. Well, I can appreciate very much the fact that you were looking for what you said, what was the weakest link. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the Christian film industry, in my opinion, was was hurting quite a bit. Exceptional stories being told. Right. Yeah. But the tools being used and the package that they were contained within uh, was hard for people to get past. Right. And so I really do appreciate um, you recognizing that need, trying to improve upon it. And uh, I personally believe uh, improvements are being made by leaps and bounds. There's some exceptional stuff being put out. Um, mm. uh, honestly, uh, one of the things that, that you helped with was Washington's Armor. We'll talk yeah. about that a little bit more in the episode. But man, Stu and I watched that at the film festival and just, just blown away. Right. Um, well the, done. There's very so. few pieces, um, and Craig will tell you, I, I'm very critical of Christian film, and there's very few pieces that I see that I'm like, man, that was done well. Washington's Armor was one of them. The Chosen was another one of them. But there, there's stuff that you go, yeah, I know that was Christian, but man, I could have... I could have mistaken that for mainstream. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's a good thing. I yeah. think that's a good thing. And if you didn't know any better, you would have mistaken it for something that they spent, you know, $60 million exactly. on <laughs> that you know that they didn't. Right. And uh, that's the power of, of yeah. the improvements that people I'm a, are using. I'm a big fan of what Dallas Jenkins has done in the Christian film space, even going back years and the work that he's done, the stories that he tells, the quality he pursues. And I think there's, there's a hand in hand that he works with there that that's, that it's not just Dallas. He works a lot with Chad Gunderson, who um, I've been very appreciative of his pursuit of quality and putting teams together and have had a chance to get to know him and work with him on a few things. Uh, and just, just even seeing the other things he's been involved in, like The Chosen. He's one of the key producers on that show. And uh, yeah, grateful to those guys for what they're doing. Stories they're telling and the way they're telling them uh, is, is really good. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about coloring. I, I can appreciate some of what you do. I don't do it nearly on the level that you do, um, but it is an element I, I feel that is is often neglected. You yep. you edit it together and maybe you you cut it really nice and it's I've got one day left before right. the deadline here and I might as well match the cameras together. Yep. Um, what kind of role does coloring play in telling a good story? Peter Jackson, and I'll, and I'll paraphrase, but Peter Jackson has said that color is one of the most, most often overlooked pieces of the filmmaking process as an opportunity to influence the audience. And he said it can be just as critical as sound, uh, art, all these other things, uh, is, is a very integral part of telling the story, but is often overlooked. That was, a, again, a paraphrase of Peter Jackson. I, I could have, I've got it quoted somewhere. I could pull it up. But um, no, I, I mean, I, I obviously that's something I do. So obviously everyone in their own department says, of course, this is important to filmmaking. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't. Um, and, and like you said, sometimes it's as simple as just matching cameras. Sometimes matching those cameras is not quite so simple. Mm -hmm. And being able to not just make it palatable to a uh, pun intended there uh, to when it comes to color <laughs> it, to to watch a film. But there are things that can be done when given the time and resources to 
lean into directions of the story even more so. Um, you know, good storytelling does not have everything explained all the time. Everything that people are thinking is not necessarily what's written in the dialogue, or at least in my opinion, shouldn't be. Now, mm-hmm. now I'm stepping on the writer's toes, I know. <laughs> but you can, you can use other tools like camera work, like art design, like acting and facial expressions, like color, even sound design and music can all be telling pieces of a story that are not being said specifically on the screen. And the way people are visually are viewing the, the media, I mean, it's a huge, huge opportunity to, to say things, whether it feels dangerous, whether it feels safe, you can set all these things up through your film and communicating to your audience pieces of the story that are important from a director's perspective, things you want to say, take the journey you want the audience to go on. Color is a huge part of being able to do that beyond just changing the color of the shirt, color, changing the color of the trees to fall because we had money and shot in the spring, do a lot of those <laughs> kind of things. Um, but yeah, when given the opportunity, you can, you can do a lot more to lean into that story for the audience. Yeah. And there's something that color does, like you mentioned to the emotion of the viewer, mm-hmm. sometimes that the viewer does not even realize is happening. Yeah. And some might consider that manipulative perhaps, but it's, <laughs> it's a good storytelling mechanism Right. Like you mentioned, yeah, you're, you're not wasting as, their time saying, now you should be feeling sad, <laughs> you know, because there's a tear running down this actress. No, yeah. you just add right. some cooler colors. And, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, if you've done your job well as a colorist, it's one of the, it's one of the areas of art that are, it's not noticed, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's more of a subconscious, which I don't feel it is as much manipulative as it is telling your story. Mm-hmm. Right. If you're if you're true to the story, you're not really manipulating people because you can get really quiet and hushed when you tell the story. Are you manipulating an audience? Well, honestly, yes, you are because people lean in. But you're it's not manipulative in a bad way. You are being effective in in taking the audience on the journey of a story for a point, for for a message, for you know, um, for that experience, whatever it is you may people anybody can use these techniques you can get very loud with it and that communicates in a certain way. So in a very similar way, you can be loud with your visuals. You can be very quiet with the visuals. Uh, you can be very nuanced in um, color. Good color is hand, very hand in hand with, with a cinematographer, very hand in hand with art design really is where some of those conversations should start. It's as simple as like for um, Pendragon, I did color for them. It was two different characters and each had very specific colors. One was more blue. One was more red, just in the clothing they wore the backgrounds, which they were. So as those two characters come together in the film, you start to notice each character wearing the other's colors and you, you're using um, subtlety, but also art design to communicate what is happening in the story. And so when those colors are off or not correct or need emphasized, that's a colorist job. You're helping communicate those um, intricacies of a story that you don't have the time. That's why books are longer, right? You don't have the time to get into as much so you're, you're kind of speeding through, interesting way to think of it, you're speeding through some of the storytelling element through other pieces mm-hmm. beyond just the text, mm-hmm. you know, or, or watching, reading paragraphs in a book, you're condensing all that into an immediate understanding through a visual, um, is it, you can start seeing those kinds of things happen. Uh, I've even seen in ET, they have the colors red and how it's used and, and blue and mixing and the shirts he wears and then you know, at the very end, he's wearing like a fully red shirt, which was some of the colors. Anyway, color is very, very influential and very helpful in telling a story in people's perspectives, the characters and how they feel and what they're going through and commitment or un- all these kind of things. You can do a lot with color. I'm sure your wife loves it when you pick apart a movie based <laughs> on color because you probably see that stuff where most yeah. people don't. Maybe even people within the industry don't even see some of the nuances in color uh, that you see, I'm sure. So, well, again, if they're doing their job well, it's even hard for me to pick up on. You yeah. have to pay close attention to it. So, I don't find it too distracting unless it's done badly. Mm. Um, it's pretty. It, it is fun if you can. Pick, if you do find one, you go, oh, I see what they're doing with this one because I'm I'm more attuned to that. But it doesn't distract too much. My wife and I are pretty vocal anyway when we watch films because we're analyzing story, we're looking yeah. at historical accuracies, we're looking at filmmaking I'm like this is an interesting angle this is an interesting we just it's we use it for study and analysis anyway is not just entertainment yeah and, and color to me is one of those things when people 
outside of the industry don't really understand why it costs so much to make a film. And it's, it's all of the details. It's all right. of the things that go into yes. it. And, and color is one of those details sure. that to, Absolutely. to get a good colorist and to have a really good, uh, you know, color pass on a film, it takes time and it takes effort and it takes energy to do so. You're look, you're looking to remove as many possible distractions from the audience's experience as possible Yeah. as a filmmaker. And, and, in, and now today we're talking about, you know, cameras are much more affordable. Oftentimes I'm dealing with a situation where we've got five camera formats all used in one scene, especially mm -hmm. when there's a high action element or something. So it's not just as simple as matching two cameras. You're matching five cameras that are not even this made from the same company. And those take a lot more time. And if you don't do it well, people are pulled out of that experience. Now they notice the mm -hmm. storytelling and, and, and you're losing them. Now they're, they're not, Mm -hmm. You're not following those characters and hearing what you're trying to say as effectively as you could if you spent the time to streamline that that visual experience for them. Yeah. So I'd imagine you would make a good instructor. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like from what I know of you, you're you're involved with something called Motion University. Um, it sounds like you've got a lot of experience and real world hands-on experience that you can share with others. Tell us about Motion University and, and why right. you're involved with it. Right. I, as someone who's naturally introverted, I, I have been hesitant to get up and speak or, you know, public speaking was really scary or getting in front of a large crowd, everyone's staring at you, lights are on you. And it still, it still um, makes my knees knock a little bit. Uh, so I was hesitant to do that. I worked for, a, um, I was helping someone put on a small film festival and they were trying to provide some education and they said, we need someone to teach on editing. You're an editor, would you talk on it? I'm like, sure. So I put together some slides and stuff and I found that I was just really excited and I was really like passionate about it. And I worked really hard to make the stuff flow and because I'm a very, you know, systematic, strategic, logical thing. So I just, you know, just right. Um, but I don't want to get too in the weeds. You want to be at, you know, applicable. And it was just really intriguing to me to see you could see the light go on and people's eyes open up and then you're like taking notes and you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm actually helping someone else do something better. I'm able to take what I, with my passion of helping elevate Christian film and I can multiply those efforts by teaching other people how to do things. If it helps them be better, it, it's multiplied because I, because I'm just me, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So in any format, when I'm able to help answer people's questions or help them understand something better or find a better technique to tell their story better, that's the ultimate goal that we're all working towards. So I love being a part of, yeah, when I can teaching. Motion University is to help filmmakers make work that is impacting, fulfilling, and sustainable. And so it's a, it's a team. Um, I have a partner who is really good with uh, visual presence. He likes doing websites and branding and is also very passionate about filmmaking stuff. Uh, and I had developed a bunch of content. And so we teamed up to turn it into an online course, all built around both of our experiences of how we stay sustainable in the business, really. Uh, he wanted to be a film director and was trying to figure out how to get started and found that he could get paid making things for local organizations, um, which is very similar to my story. And so we've using these opportunities as practice because we all make mistakes we're all learning and growing uh, using these skills along the way helps us stay sustainable um, but also helps us become better filmmakers and when we turn then into some narrative stuff at different opportunities our skills are more honed along the way and it's not just you know one off one off one off and it's not just short films mm -hmm. um, which are very hard to make money from and be sustainable so it's very it's very um intentionally impacting work fulfilling work and sustainable which we have found promo filmmaking to be a good outlet and avenue for that so we teach an online course that's eight weeks where we've broken making a project down into eight weeks from uh, helping you understand why you're in the business and getting started to working with clients to communicating with clients to filming we teach technical stuff on lighting how to set up interviews how to direct interviews then we do a week on editing we have assignments we grade the assignments we have weekly coaching calls it's a very interactive wow. Uh, course all towards at the end of the three weeks or eight weeks, you have a three minute ish promo film that you've made for an organization. A lot of people do it for their church or for a local coffee shop, or we help you find something that's manageable, doable and helping people get started. So when they leave, when they're done with the course, they have skills 
that they can charge money for that help them increase their gear, increase their skills to stay in business and be a resource to other people making films. But all of these, what's, what I think is fascinating and often missed in the filmmaking circles is the, is the local opportunities to help other organizations that are doing great work yes. impact helping them be successful and helping them make an impact mm -hmm. is um, I think arguably on par with at least some of the basic, basically successful feature films that are being put out on Amazon, which if you're putting out for free, it's just, there's a struggle in, in making money in feature films. And there's a huge impact for feature films in a narrative genre. But when we're, if we're looking for fulfilling and impacting, we're sometimes having a hard time finding the sustainability side of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's always, just as it's, a, it's really sad to me to see someone making great work that people won't finish watching because it's poor quality, people who are great storytellers and filmmakers who aren't able to uh, make a living or, or you know, find income from that is really sad to me. We, I, I think those voices are important. And so in between the big gigs, we can make smaller projects that are still very story driven that refine our skills and, and are sustainable. So that's a huge goal of Motion University. We have um, an ongoing coaching program that we meet weekly with, with our alumni. And then we've had a, an on set where we make a project and students come on board and learn. And go. Um, that one's gonna be a little, a little different this year, probably just with everything that's been going on and um, just the unique, the, new, the, the unique year of 2020 that we're experiencing. But we, we still do bring uh, students on, bring people on to projects that we make sometimes um, because that in-person experience and coaching is really helpful as well. Very, very directly coaching, very directly applicable um, take-home content is what we're, yeah. we're all about communicating through Motion University, helping filmmakers uh, be successful and, and stay, in the, stay in the business, stay in the industry. Yeah, so it's, I mean, you certainly have, I, I would say, class work. It's obviously online class, but you guys seem to be really emphasizing the hands-on, just get yes. them creating get them right. doing yeah. and right. any of us in the in the field can can say that actually right. doing the thing teaches you far more than the hours sitting in class talking about doing right. the thing right so. it's very much we have weekly lectures and then we have application and a lot of people that, to me i'll speak from an introvert's perspective a lot of people in filmmaking oddly enough are introverted um are hesitant when the phone calls and they say, Hey, I want a project. And you get your, your hands get sweaty and your tongue swells up. And you're just like, I, how do I don't know if I'm charging enough? How do I know what, how to make what they're doing? So when phone calls, talking to people are very intimidating parts of the process. And even if you're not going into promo, you still got to talk to department heads. You still have to learn how to talk to directors. Like talking to people is, is a skill you mm -hmm. will need to be successful mm -hmm. in life, but even specifically in film industry. So that's, again, all of these things you learn in promo filmmaking, you can repeat, repeat, repeat much, much faster and iterate and grow. It's a safe place to grow and have to do some of those things if you've never done them before, because we are there to help analyze the situation. Say, here's how you could do something different. Here's how you can improve on this one. Here's where we can congratulate you and say, that was actually right on. That was, you've done a great job. So having that kind of clarity was helpful for me starting out. And so I'm, I'm, trying to provide opportunities for other people to have that type of experience um, as they're learning, growing, starting. Uh, it's even people that aren't just starting, if they've been doing it a while, if they have, if they, if they want to grow, analyzing each one of these um, disciplines that we have broke out into these weeks, is just a very direct focused way to, to do that and to mm -hmm. say, here's how we do that. And then you can analyze your process and we're there for coaching to answer questions. Um, I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So check out that program at uh, motionuniversity.org. So yes. after the break, we're going to talk to John Clay about his role on Washington's armor, which is something, oh man, super excited about. Yeah. So let's talk about Lessons from the Land, the Gospels for a minute. It's now available on our website, and you can watch all of the videos completely for free. You know, that's, it's, it's true because they're great for family devotionals. Uh, they're great for homeschool groups who might be looking for history or geography on the Bible or for children's Bible classes. Uh, there's everything from lessons on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we have a lesson on an oil lamp. I mean, just all kinds of different topics from the Gospels with great application for kids. 
Yeah, and I love that not only did we create these videos, but there's this fantastic workbook that our team put together that goes along with each lesson. The videos are intended to be this springboard uh, to begin your, your class setting with. So uh, it's, it's full with uh, great activities and discussion prompts, coloring pages. You can find the videos and the workbooks on our website, appianmedia.org. Now let's get back to the show. So John Clay, if you could give us a synopsis of Washington's Armor. What is this all about? Washington's Armor is focused on the story of early in George Washington's life, showing God's hand of protection and providence uh, through him growing into being a general and and actually pre you know previous to him being president. So even even him growing into um, being the man for that job and the lessons he learned, the growth he went through, but seeing God's hand uh, in the founding of our nation through his life. Fantastic. You know, and I'm like Craig said earlier, we, we watched this, uh, I guess, pilot premiere at Content 19, and we were both just amazed by it. Uh, a big crew, I mean, kind of talk about what was it like to work with the director and work with all those folks on that production? Yeah, no, it was a great team. Uh, it was very, very talented people, um, some of which I had worked with before and got to meet some new friends as well. So it, yeah, it couldn't have been a, it couldn't have been a better crew. It, it would, at every turn, you felt like, wow, this, these people are very passionate. They're very dedicated to their craft, their particular discipline in the craft, and and really did a great job of elevating the whole production in each one of those areas, from art to cinematography to sound like we just had some really really great people working on it and and tammy tammy lane is the director of the show uh, she had a really clear vision and um just a real passion for telling this story um it wasn't just an offhand thing she she thought ah oh, you know this would be a nice thing to do next she's been working on this for years mm -hmm. and um, i was really excited to just have the opportunity to be a part of the production uh, just because I'm a, I'm a fan of george washington i had read about his life in eric Metaxas. Uh, Sutherland, well, I mean, I'm aware of George Washington just as an American, right? But had read more about his life more specifically in Eric Metaxas' book, Seven Men, and was and, and thought, man, there's just, there's really a good story in this. Um, I can't believe it hasn't really been told. And then about a year later, I heard this project was in development and I thought, whatever, whatever I need to do, like, <laughs> yes, let's tell great stories from history that are encouraging, um, and, and historically true, but encouraging and, uh, and, and needed. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I really appreciate about Washington's Armor is, is that it was the subtlety. Uh, this film wasn't meant to just be like Washington's not going to stop and give a devotional or a call to action or, a, you know, whatever the an altar call, whatever you want to call <laughs> it. Um, but it was like it was subtly written in underneath about the history of this real person and how his belief in God and his faith in God uh, really made an impact on him personally. And of course that made an impact on our country. And like that, I love that subtlety in the writing and the way it was played out in the, in the pilot. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't want to make it a call out um, in a, in a way that wasn't necessarily reflective of the times. It was more ingrained into the culture at that time. It was more a part of their day-to-day -day life. And so to, to represent that um, was true to history. And then also, you know, was just demonstrating what, what it was like for him to, to have that as the backbone of the actions and things he, he took and the decisions he made. And I think um, from what I've, I've heard, we'll maybe even explored more in coming episodes. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see where they end up going with the, with the you, show as well. Are you allowed to tell us more? So what's the status um, of it? This was a pilot episode. Right, yes. and it was meant to generate I, interest and funding. Um, that's that's all I know. That's all. I know. <laughs> that's all I know. Yeah, you, you can't even make some stuff food. up. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I have not heard any official information. Um, I'm I'm excited with along with everyone else to see where this goes. I really hope that you do get picked up in distribution, and I would I would love to see it do really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's another question. Uh, obviously, people can go online. Mm -hmm to washingtonsarmor.com yes and watch the trailer 
Yes. Um, I assume it's still being circulated through film festivals and such, I guess, when those start happening again. <laughs> um, are, are there plans to make that pilot episode available to the general public? I am not, I'm not aware of the, um, I mean, yes, at some point, that's the goal to make it, to make it available to the public. I'm not, I'm not sure what the ultimate distribution plans are. I know they've been researching opportunities and, and options for distribution. Yeah. Well, it's worth seeing for it, sure. It is for sure. Yeah. If you can get your hands on it. Uh, I want to ask you a really geeky question. I really get into this stuff. It's kind of the behind the scenes, but like you were, you did DIT on mm -hmm. that production, on that pilot. You know, there yes. were some extremely, what looked to be extremely remote locations. <laughs> I mean, what's it like doing D? I mean, I know what DIT looks like on a big production. You roll your card onto set. You've got all your, you know, everything on it and it's good to go. Were you sitting right. on a tree stump in the middle of winter in the, I mean, like with your laptop trying to download the, I mean, what did that look like? Do we need right. to explain right. to our listeners we should. Maybe for the layman what yeah. you mean by DIT? DIT. I mean, sure. you, well, you explain it, John Clay. Oh, uh, yeah, DIT is digital imaging technician. They are responsible for the signal. The, the, they actually work very closely with the cinematographer and making sure what's being captured is what is needed and can even be involved in the development of the color even immediately as they're filming, um, backing up data. Uh, the list of things that a DIT can do is like a hundred things. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, they're very, very involved in the capturing of the, the digital uh, image that, that's desired by, for the production. Um, so just a point of clarification, technically for this production, it would be better uh, to describe my role as data management as opposed to a DIT. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't we didn't have a full cart. We weren't running out in the snow. We weren't doing those kinds of things, uh, and and even some of yeah for most of the production we weren't we weren't doing that. So it was more taking the cards, making sure we didn't lose footage, um, making sure we had a good backup system, syncing sound, getting it all prepped for editing was more my process on that production, as opposed to I don't I don't want to downplay or presume that what I was doing was representative of most DITs. Mm. Um, they're yeah they've mm. got very impressive gear and stuff they use and. Um, it was pretty different from what from my role. Technically, it was labeled because that still fits under a definition of a DIT, but it was a it was a more um, stripped down version of of the DIT work that was that was my job on that set. But we, yeah, in the the New York, we were shot in upstate New York for the snow scenes, and I was back at the lodge, and they had enough card space. They would come back for lunch, and I would start offloading, and then they, we would make runs back and forth as needed. Or they were filming even on the grounds there, and I could walk out and pick up cards and, and come back. And I had my my station set up in a more secure area. Not no, we didn't have any. <clears throat> we weren't sitting on any stumps. I did work out of a trailer, <laughs> some um, that didn't end up working just for sound purposes. And so we had. Um, I usually moved around to wherever they were doing lunch and uh, meals. That was kind of a base camp usually with with restrooms and all this other stuff that they kind of operated out of. And transport would go back and forth, and we would just kind of make adjustments as we needed to pick up cards, move cart, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that was an easy, easy access point through that. And it was stable electricity and that kind of thing, which is really important for backing up and not making sure we don't have any glitches and lose data. So it sounds like to me, you're, you're doing a really good job of downplaying the amount of work That's that right. you put into. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I can relate on a, you know, probably even lesser uh, version of this. I'm normally in charge of backing up our content when we're out in the field. Um, it's not an easy job and no. it's a pretty important job. Very important um, job. Yeah. And I assume it's, it's exciting for you to kind of see what's coming in. You sure. Know, uh, man, the stuff that they were shooting, especially there in the snow, uh, right. some pretty epic content coming in. I mean, yeah, yeah. They had some, they had some really, uh, great locations, which are, which are, you know, very helpful for, aiding that that epic visual landscape um but yeah just the work done by the cinematographers and stuff you know to then capture the epicness that you're in is is really important too now it was it was uh some fun stuff really cold i'm not i'm not a, i bet I'm it was really northern, cold in I'm that lodge boy so it, yeah it was pretty cold that's right we survived <laughs> so we like to ask this of, of all of our guests uh, are there any specific tools that you have found helpful in your own Bible study and, and teaching, um, as you're, like you said, trying to communicate truth in a, in a quality mm -hmm. way, what are some tools that you use or would, would recommend to others? Sure. Um, I mean, one of, from, a, from the Bible study, I really love the Logos app, mm -hmm. uh, which is 
free. Um, you can do paid versions if you want that expand the library and there's all kinds of other features. Um, but just even the app on the phone is just really helpful for doing word studies, doing Greek, you know, uh, look up to find cross references. Uh, it's very easy. You can highlight, take notes. It's just a very robust um, Bible app, if you will, uh, for the digital version of that. I mean, I still, your question was on digital. I'm still a little preferential to some in hand, you know, Bible where you can flip pages and actually underline and bookmark and those kind of things. So yeah. I, I'm not a, I'm not full on the digital side entirely, but uh, I have used that and it's been very helpful in some of the, the Bible study side of, side of things for sure. And, and you had said before we started uh, recording that you have a passion for helping men specifically um, that are dealing with or struggling with things. Kind of, kind of talk about what, what are you doing with that? Yes. Well, moral purity is a, is a big passion um, just from my own journey and, and struggles I've had in my past. And um, we can expound on all of these things in depth. Um, how do, let's do an abbreviated version. I believe for the gospel to be shown and the love of Christ to be effectively shown, especially from men, um, sexual morality of any form is just one of the key detractors is one of the key weapons the, the the enemy uses to just pull the backbone out of men and we need we need men in the church who can lead that can demonstrate the gospel applying to our lives to lead their families to lead their communities um and and i've just seen that in my own life i i i know i know what it is to live under failure and i also know what it is to live with freedom and the excitement and joy and uh, true intimacy that can be found uh, in freedom. And so I, I really have a heart to help men um, take responsibility to uh, love their families, to love the church, to love God wholeheartedly, um, to walk in the grace and freedom that God has provided through the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as, as Christians, um, the grace and power is there and uh, so, yeah, I, I have a huge passion for that. I've seen it make a huge difference in my life. Uh, so using digital tools, uh, I started uh, an Instagram account. I've got a website called steadfastmen.com. And I, what I did is I went to four mentors that have been influential in my life and just recorded uh, an hour-long conversation with them. And those are available for free. All four of them are. Uh, one of them is with a pastor friend of mine. Uh, who I've, who's been a mentor and I deeply respect Philip Telfer. I also had someone from the team at Covenant Eyes talk about boundaries and filters. How does that play into our lives? We talked with uh, Eric Ludi from Ellerslie, who runs a biblical discipleship ministry. We've done some other video work with them. Huge fan of what they're doing and um, encouraging people to live out the gospel in, in the day to day. Um, and just has a, he has a huge heart for men as well and can talk to fathers who are, are, have questions about how to talk to their sons. And how do we teach our children about these things? At what ages? What do we say? How, how can we be helpful in, in educating our kids? So he had a great perspective. And then um, one of my favorites was Paul Speed, who runs Whatever It Takes Ministries, which is the ministry uh, that I went through training with that very, very directly changed my life um, in, in a significant way. And talking with some of his focuses are on marriage and, and what does confession of sin look like? What does it look like to be a battle partner with your spouse? Not again, not not your spouse, not your enemy, willing to do whatever it takes to walk in freedom. And so anyway, all of those are available for free. Uh, it's a free resource. I've got it on Instagram as well, where I'm posting little clips and snippets and um, quotes from the guys and the men. Um, but really just trying to provide answers, trying to provide help uh, more than, well, you just need to love Jesus better. Yeah. You just need to read your Bible. What does that mean? How do I take those things and apply them? What does that look like when I am facing it? What does it look like when I've sinned and I need to make it right? How do I go about living this out of my life? I had huge questions that I, I didn't have answers for years. And so some of the men have helped me find answers in that that really changed my life. I'm trying to make those resources available to other people. Hopefully it's helpful to them as well. Well, it's, I'm looking at steadfastmen.com right now and, and I bookmarked it because it's a, that looks like an awesome site with lots of content. Uh, just, you know, really great. And, you know, when you talk about media, um, yes. we, we all know sitting around the table that Satan is using media in... Yes amazingly effective ways, yes. uh, whether it's something 
that seems as harmless as a movie mm. uh, with a scene or something right. as grotesque as pornography, uh, right. he has found ways to use it effectively. And yeah. so I feel like it's, it's up to us and it's up to people like us to take that, 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 that thing that he's weaponized and yes. turn it around and say, you're not going to do this. We're going right. to use it for good. And yes. now we really appreciate you this bringing that a, up. Yeah, this is a fantastic resource. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, we'll put this in the show notes for sure. Definitely recommend people check that out. Thank you for using the tools in this way. Mm-hmm. I think that I personally feel that Christians have too long been afraid to use mm-hmm. the tools mm-hmm. as bravely as this. And, and we've, we've let Satan run wild with it. And so the fact that you're turning turning that weapon against him, mm-hmm. um, I appreciate that very much. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and it's a subject that I think as as the church, or as people, it's hard to talk about and has been avoided. Um, and so finding men who who are willing to talk about it in a more open manner because they have they have something to base it on. They have seen failure and found freedom in their own life. I think is helpful in in providing help and answers to people that are looking for that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really glad this was well worth the wait. Like I said, it was months (laughs) trying to get you on here and uh, man, this has been a really good conversation. Thank you, John Clay. Well, thanks for letting me share about the things that I'm passionate about. Uh, I really, I I really do just want to see truth and things, uh, truth, again, you can put capital T in there if you want to, truth communicated with excellence is what I'm passionate about. Thanks for allowing me another opportunity to to share. Hopefully these things are helpful. Thank you for what you guys are doing and uh, for pushing through. Glad we made it work. Absolutely. In Roads is a production of Appian Media. We're a nonprofit video production company that's 100% crowdfunded. If you're interested in learning more about how you can support Appian Media so we can continue to create more great free content, you can visit us at appianmedia.org slash inroads. On the next episode, we'll talk with Dave Stotts. He's the host of the popular series Drive Through History. We'll talk with him about why he started the program, how it's grown, and get his favorites for Bible study tools. That's all on the next episode of Inroads. Mm-hmm.